a very good morning to conveyor of today's webinar principal dr g sudhakar sir our honorable speaker dr aslam arif sir and orthopedic surgeon and managing director of arif nursing home to all the distinguished principals professors faculty and students myself dr d nivedita assistant professor of srinivasrao college of pharmacy vishakhapatnam now we have entered the day 6 session with a cognizant and eminent speaker dr aslam arif sir orthopedic surgeon and managing director of arif nursing home today i am very honored and delighted to read a formal introduction about our guest speaker dr aslam arif sir he is going to deliver a guest lecture on how to improve immunization during covid 19 he is a great doctor teacher researcher guide and kind hearted human with helping hands to one in need who conducted number of medical camps in rural villages and he also conducts pre bone density checkups in his hospital every second saturday he is one of the founder and organizer of the faza foundation which caters to thousands of poor and needy orphans and aged unemployed and destitute dr aslam arif sir hails from vishakhapatnam he graduated mbbs from osmania medical college hyderabad he has specialized in orthopedic surgery and super specialized in arthroscopic surgery and orthobiology he also has a degree in medical law from symbiosis institute in pune sir also did fellowships from uk france belgium and netherlands in arthroscopy and arthroplasty his great research thinking and execution is exemplified by his international and national publications seven international and 35 national publications research projects on bone making cartilage preservation procedures and stem cell therapy he is the course director and also national faculty for arthroscopy and arthroplasty he is the founder and president of the state arthroscopic association and faculty for international students in arthroscopy and arthroplasty he established the first center for sports medicine in north coastal ap as well as operation bone bank in andhra pradesh over 150 orthopedic surgeons train in arthroscopy and arthroplasty some of them being the most flourished surgeons presently he is serving as the managing director of arif nursing home which was established by a great surgeon and philanthropist dr mehdi and supported by dr zia mehdi a gynecologist and philanthropist herself this is the brief introduction about today's eminent speaker thanks sir for accepting our invitation and on the behalf of our management and faculty we cordially welcome you to take over today's session please take over the session sir thank you thank you dr nivedita for a wonderful you, introduction uh, thank you as you said i thank you for giving me this opportunity and you would have noticed that uh, to the uh, all the attendees that i being a surgeon uh, i am going to talk on immunity it really doesn't match a surgeon uh, to a physician's topic but if you understand that uh, people of wisdom have always given us a path in times of difficulty his holiness molana amiruddin malik sahib once said that in future your survival will depend on your immunity doesn't it sound very familiar in the present situation we have been caught up in a pandemic which most of the uh, research minds haven't been able to contemplate and also find a way out so we are trying to come out of the situation losing as few lives as possible we have seen in the past few months that this has really exploded throughout the world from place to place and most of the advanced countries who call themselves the developed countries have been most affected so what do you do in situations like this most of the times we surgeons do get caught up in situations when you are faced with the situation in hand and you do not have adequate equipment then you have to prioritize and you have to do something which is necessary for you to get to the goal then something is this situation also is something like that and so we have to give it a thought a surgeon's thought you have a problem on hand you don't have a solution but you have your mind and you have enough literature with you look into it and find a way out 
So what we did was look at the past pandemics. Most of you have known that this world has gone through a number of plagues and pandemics. Okay. So what we do is just go back a little and see what happened in the past, what we have in our hands to manage and come out of the situation with as little damage as possible. If you are a, a student of the Mayo Clinic, you will like Dr. Charles and Dr. Williams very much. What do they say? There are two objects of medical education, to heal the sick and to advance the science. And the glory of medicine is always moving. And there is always more to learn. We will go forward and look back in the history and see what the pandemics and how the pandemics look like and when it happened. So we have a good timeline. This video will take us through. Just observe the time, the casualties, the causative organisms and how this situation occurred. Way back in year 165 to 180, there were 5 million deaths from measles and smallpox occurred in the Roman Empire, which was imported by the troops, Roman troops who were fighting elsewhere. The Justinian plague, 50 million, 30 to 50 million deaths caused by a bacteria spread by rats infected with fleas. Japanese smallpox endemic, 735 to 37. 1 million deaths caused by a virus, variola major. Till one third of the Japanese population then. Black death, year 1347 to 51. 200 million deaths caused by a bacteria. 60% of the European population was lost. New World Smallpox, as it was called, 1520 onwards. 55 million deaths so far. You can see as the population keeps increasing, and so do the casualties. The Italian plague caused 1 million deaths in 1629 to 31. 25 percent of its population was lost. Bought by the tubes after war. The Great, Great Plague of London, very well studied, 65 to 66, 100,000 deaths caused by a bacteria, one-fourth of the London's population was lost. The cholera pandemic, 1817 to 23, 1 million deaths caused by bacteria cholera, severe dehydration, diarrhea and vomiting. Third plague pandemic, 85, 12 million deaths from Yunnan, China. The Russian flu caused 1 million deaths. You can see now the virus starts to create havoc. H2N2 from Bukhara. Yellow fever, 1,50,000 in the US. It swept through Philadelphia. The Spanish flu, 50 million casualties. H1N influenza virus. Virus originated in pigs and infected 500 million people. The Asian flu in 57 to 58, 2 million deaths, H2N2 influenza virus from the birds originated in China again. The Hong Kong flu was 1 million deaths, H3N2 influenza virus originated in Hong Kong, China. Hong Kong, China. The 
the AIDS virus from 1881, continuing still with 35 million deaths, a retrovirus HIV originated in West Central Africa from the chimps. The SARS, you remember, coronavirus SARS-CoV-1, which jumped from bats to humans, Guangdong, China. The swine flu with 200,000 deaths, H1N1 influenza virus, first detected in the US. The Ebola virus from wild animals in Western Africa, 14 and 16, 2004, you remember, I think. The MERD, Middle East virus, originated in Saudi Arabia, which came to humans from camels. And now to the present situation, COVID-19 and the death rate is still counting. So what does the virus look like? It is a microscopic structure which has a core of RNA enclosed in a lipid envelope with protein spikes. What is the structure? How is it able to penetrate human cell and multiply? Which has caused so much of havoc. So this virus is covered with protein particles which are called spikes. They are twisted amino acids, protein. Each has a head called the S1 and a stalk like structure called the S2. One of the heads is slightly tilted, which enables it to bind to the ACE receptor too. Once the connection is established, the virus receptor the head breaks off because of an enzyme TMPRS2. Once the head breaks, the stock protein grows in size and penetrates the cell wall. Once inside the cell, it retracts and pulls the virus into the cell by a process which is called endocytosis and there it multiplies in the ribosomes and comes back. This is an electron microscope picture where you can see on the surface the virus particles emerging from the cell. This is how it looks like in a close-up. All the yellow particles are virus which are exiting the cell. So what happens if this is causing such a lot of damage? Have we really understood what the pathology or pathogenesis of this virus is? Well, let's, let's try to understand what is happening really. As we thought, it is not a simple viral pneumonia. The rise in inflammatory markers and the drop in your oxygen saturation is disproportionate initially to your CT or X-ray chest findings. So the virus is simply an antigenic medium that instigate a systemic inflammatory response which causes all the damage. The progress from moderate to severe COVID-19 disease is that of a systemic inflammatory response. It goes through five stages. Stage one is a local reaction at the site of injury and aims at containing the injury and limit the spread. So the immune effector cells at the site release cytokines. Please keep this in mind. The cytokines is causing havoc. The release of these cytokines that in turn stimulate the reticular endothelial system, promoting wound repair through local inflammation. That is the natural process that happens. And then the body again goes back into a compensatory anti-inflammatory phase, which tries to limit this process. Unfortunately, in the stage three, when it goes there, 
the scale tips over and the pro inflammatory resulting in progressive endothelial dysfunction causing coagulopathy and activation of this coagulation pathway it results in end organ microthrombosis and progressive increase in capillary permeability eventually resulting in loss of circulatory integrity so we have tipped over towards the pro inflammatory system the body now again overdrives into an anti inflammatory response resulting in a state of immunosuppression so the inflammatory response has caused damage the anti inflammatory response takes you into a stage of immunosuppression the individual therefore becomes susceptible to secondary or nosocomial infection depending on where you are then the stage 5 manifests with multi organ dysfunction syndrome and dysregulation of both the inflammatory and the non inflammatory pathways so, you know as far as stage 2 there is a provision of your being reverted back but once it progresses from stage 2 it rapidly progresses to stage 5 and sometimes there is no stage in between just as i mentioned tolicizumab does work in between these two stages but rarely is this stage identified most amazing part is the lack of rise of pulse rate or a respiratory rate with the following oxygen saturations in your body we know that in all the conditions the slightest deterioration of oxygen is matched by the rising pulse rate and your rising respiratory rate this does not happen in the early stage of covid-19 now usually with hypoxia you are entering into hypercarbia and subsequently acidosis when this happens you have a signaling system which is called central chemoreceptors they are peripheral chemoreceptors and your carotid body the function of these is to check the level of oxygen the level of carbon dioxide and the ph of your blood unfortunately the virus manages to block all the three chemoreceptors since respiration is not stimulated the pulmonary stretch receptors are also dormant leading to absence of tachycardia this leads us to thinking the same viral antigen stimulation leads to variable responses from an asymptomatic to a fatal response the question in our mind here is is it dose related is a certain amount of dose a lesser amount of dose causes immunity and a larger amount of dose causes fatality if that is so then that little amount which has causes antibody rise could develop as herd immunity that is exactly what we are looking for till the vaccines are ready so what do we do about this now we have understood there is a problem and the problem is very grievous what do you do all the immunologists have put their minds to developing a vaccine but i think we are not yet in this stage we will face these trials are on we don't know when the results will be out and when it goes into production till then what do you do as i told you as a surgeon when you're in a situation you look for improvisation here we look at our own literature what are the things that you're looking at holistic techniques to boost your immunity some supplements that you require and just for the sake uh, of the viewers this presentation does not constitute a medical advice this is like uh, we are just suggesting that these could be of help to you to tide over the present situation so we are looking at now how to develop your immunity so the first most important thing is looking at sleep you got to have it all the uh, factors that i am going to be discussing you of late i have gone through a lot of literature and looking at it from a scientific angle i will be giving you a lot of the references from which this uh, presentation has been made so this study of 57000 female nurses what did it say the relative risk of pneumonia if you do not have adequate sleep of 5 hours per night is 39% 
and if your perception of inadequate sleep is there if, if you haven't slept for 5 hours then the risk goes up by 50% this is very clearly documented sleep nutrition and athletes for sleep to have restorative effect on your body it must be adequate duration and quality particularly for athletes whose physical and mental recovery needs may be greater due to the high physiological and psychological demands placed on them during training sessions sleep has been shown to have restorative effect on your immune system i have some tips for you you set a regular because all the timings have gone here when you from the time we have got into the lockdown system and then unlock one and unlock two the whole system has gone here offices have closed down the work hours have changed so you in this situation form a regular habit pattern regular bedtime and wake times don't take naps in between no big meals 4 to 6 hours before bedtime no vigorous exercises 4 to 6 hours before bedtime avoid caffeine have a hot bath because your body has to cool down for you to have a good sleep noise perfume some people do require music etc so you have an aid which helps you to sleep if you can't do that then you can look at some supplements like melatonin gaba theanine and taurine before we start with uh well, let's like you take you to the cortisol rhythm daily cortisol rhythm it is high during the daytime when you wake up which gives you the energy to go through the day's activity by the afternoon mid afternoon evening and night the cortisol levels start to drop and when this happens this is like a circadian rhythm and helps you to get your body activity down and then get into sleep so if you have a very low level and you are not very active in the morning or if you have a very high level also doesn't help so in between this would be the normal pattern that you would require to have some values melatonin is a well studied natural body hormone for sleep secreted by the pineal gland the production increases with age effectivity decreases with sorry decreases with age it has a circadian rhythm is a reproductive hormone in lower animals and it is a very well studied hormone 26000 citations and melatonin and melatonin is quite well studied with five or more than 4500 citations for sleep what are the utilizations amplifies your anti humoral activity that is exactly what you need used to treat your rhythm disorders so melatonin when you have a jet lag when your timings have changed you work in different hours you are not working to your body circadian rhythm you go to work in the evening come back in the morning you sleep in the morning so when this happens your rhythm is is the shit is changed and you want to get it back to your normal this improves your sleep latency sleep efficacy and rising sleep quality in the elderly regulates the tone of your cerebral artery is very important for longevity melatonin receptors in the vascular base regulate your body temperature that is what will help you to sleep the major messenger of light dependent periodicity so it's like a switch which switches on and off your sleep what are the fun facts secretion increases at night obviously peaks 40 minutes after light deprivation so the moment you switch off your lights 40 minutes after it peaks half life is 25 minutes to 75 minutes 75% secreted by pineal gland etc level are maximum at the age of 1 and then from then it started decreasing the levels peak 25 to 100 fold within minutes of switching off your light has no toxic dose you can take as much as you want is in your limits the physiological dose is 0.3 mg what does it do we are interested in the immunity aspect also increases the natural killer activity modulates your immune function used in network based drug repurposing for treatment may improve nighttime urination in elderly relieves oxidative stress from stress induced behaviors and immunologically challenged rats 
So most of the studies that we will be quoting is from rats because you can't stress human beings as much as you can stress your rats, and which gives us enough information. How is it related to respiratory diseases? Our field of interest. Receptor dependent and independent effects have seen, and it has antioxidant, anti cancer, anti tumor, anti inflammatory, anti aging, anti diabetic, anti viral, and neuroprotective activities. It has a productive effect on respiratory diseases for infection. You have preparations which are regular, which peak and then go down and then micronize SR levels. So you have to have adequate levels of both. Do we have any contraindications? Not really. One person will have a stimulatory effect. So as soon as they have melatonin, the sleep goes away and they become very elevated, mood elevated. It sometimes milli milli affects those who are addicted to sleeping pills. So in that condition, you can start with a higher dose and then taper it off slowly. So that was about sleep. The second step that we are getting into is stress. So we will be discussing five steps. Second stress is stress. Doesn't this seem very familiar, especially in these situations? It suppresses your immune system. Important. Upsets digestive and reproductive system. Very well known. Increases the risk of heart attacks most of them. Shrinks your hippocampus via your cortisol levels. But the advantage is the moment your stress goes away, your hippocampus comes back to its normal. What are the main causes of stress? Pessimism, inability to accept uncertainty, rigid thinking, lack of flexibility, negative self-talks, unrealistic expectations, and all on an attitude. I think this is very common. Most of that, most of us would relate to one of these causes. The top, the few of the top 10 stressful events in, a, in your life are already in front of you. The first is imprisonment. Imprisonment would be social distancing, where you can't meet your friends, you can't go and spend time with them. There are Ill injuries and illnesses, there are job losses, and there are retirements. Retirements is not just from your job, but whatever you do on a daily basis. Is your life has suddenly taken a major turn. These are all very stressful events in your life. How does it affect your immune system? Aggravates mucosal and immune damage in the mouse model. As I told you, you can stress the mice more than you can stress humans. And there has been found to have a damage in the mucosal lining. Causes death of leukocytes and the stem cells. More severe damage the longer the exposure and disrupts your microbiota immune brain axis, which is being studied now extensively. Alters your immune response during respiratory infections. A study on the murine and cephalomyelitis virus model show the glucocorticoid implicated decrease in T cell function. Stress induced immunosuppression may provide a mechanism for enhanced viral persistence within the CNS and makes the herpes simplex virus type 1 infections more worse via increase in glucocorticoid disease as a result of your stress. What do you do about it? First of all, avoid catastrophizing. Try and simplify your situation. Try and look at it as a positive angle and avoid fortune telling. Like an example, I just know I have a hard time getting a job. I know I will lose my job. I just know I'm going to get sick. These are things which you have to avoid. And right now in this situation, I think about the messages that you must be seeing on your WhatsApp, on Facebook, Twitter, etc. And I believe me, and I go through those messages every day and there is nothing positive about those messages in your, in your message. So if you can, just stay away from that. Look at a positive mood. This book by Burns, Feeling Good, The New Mood. If you can get a copy of this, it's good. How to get out of the negative aspect of thinking and stress. So what would you do? 
keep a regular schedule keep a regular wake up time schedule your work if you have things to do at home fine or if you want to search get a job search exercise is an excellent stress buster it has been extensively researched to study and i would just like to make a small mention because this is a very big subject in itself meditate and practice mindfulness just meditation or a prayer will in a big way help as a stress buster just read a book from whichever religion you belong to and believe me it it will make a lot of difference exercise is regular and regulation of immune system has been studied ex- extensively what does it say exercise indeed is a powerful behavioral intervention and has a potential to improve your immunity and health outcomes because it was more studied in the elderly we mentioned elderly and obese but in all the situations this has a good outcome here as a caution i'd like to mention that single bouts of prolonged exercises may impair your t cell and nk cell functions or neurotrophic functions therefore try and limit your exercises to a bearable limit i would ad- advise you uh, 30 to 45 minute sessions on a daily basis if you are, are not a regular and then gradually improve but don't go in for single bout prolonged exercises which can cause uh, problems in the present situation as well these are things that you can do uh, skip the one and find some aid which help you to as stress busters or you help you to sleep we go to stress uh, st- step 3 important that we are looking at vegetables now and i will tell you why boost your antioxidant consider vitamin c supplementation very important okay. carotenoids your vegetables have a lot of these carotenoids and so the carotenoids and antioxidants we will be studying carotenoids do help in a long way once you want to measure the carotenoid levels are directly antioxidants and if your antioxidant level can be measured it would be a good indicator whether you have a good health or would you be uh, would you want to increase your carotenoids so uh, carotenoids can be measured this is a sample report which shows vitamin c vitamin q most of these are within normal limits except for n acetyl cysteine but this is an ex- ex- expensive uh, test and you you would like to do something which is easily done you don't want to stress your already stressed patients to get into a very expensive blood or a urine test so there is a, a device a handheld device which measures skin carotenoids from your palm there are a number of these studies which has proven that the raman spectrometer does give us adequate report and a, a, a good report on the level of carotenoid just from your skin the totality of the evidence supports that use of skin carotenoid status as an objective biomarker of fruit and vegetable intake skin carotenoids may effectively serve as an integrated biomarker of your health what better so you could do on a large scale and assess the health and then advise this is a wonderful study and with uh, by akbar ali on vascular aging study epidemiology of vascular aging and it says that if you are in the lowest quartile of your carotenoids you have a three fold increase in the rate of mortality means your plasma carotenoid levels were independently associated with mortality carotenoids is equal to antioxidants is equal to inflammation there is no doubt about it we have 20000 citations on this already So look at what are the antioxidants vitamin c supports your epithelial function right vitamin c is one of the most important antioxidants accumulates in phagocytic cells can enhance chemotaxis phagocytosis generation of reactive oxygen species and ultimately microbial killing how much do you require on a prophylactic basis you would take 100 to 200 mg a day that would be enough but on a therapeutic basis that which is now required 
you require gram doses that is more doses at least one gram three times a day would be adequate what does it cause chemotaxis enhanced neutrophil phagocytic capacity and oxidative killing supports lymphocyte proliferation and function it works as an antiviral it has worked in influenza herpes polio venereal equine encephalomyelitis h2lv hiv and power virus and there is no reason it should not work in covid 2 covid 19 it inhibits epstein barr virus activation inhibits cytomegalovirus replications tightens your endothelial permeability barrier essential factor on antiviral response for h3n1 influenza a these are all proven unfortunately humans and primates do not have this enzyme called gulo this enzyme helps in synthesizing vitamin c in the body so as an experiment if you don't have vitamin c and if you don't have both vitamin c and the uh, enzyme you can be in lot of trouble so if you, as an experiment on on the mice it was tried by inoculating h3 into in a minus minus that is both minus glo and minus vitamin c and was extremely lethal vitamin c is used in anti inflammatory in the treatment of sepsis and decreases respiratory sensation virus lung inflammation we are interested in this sepsis is associated with acute deficiency of vitamin c as we seen before vitamin c corticosteroids and thiamine act synergistically to reverse sepsis induced organ dysfunction and the most recent study use of intra minus uh, intravenous vitamin c for reduction of cytokine storm in respiratory respiratory distress syndromes which is as recent as april 21 2020 so if you were in a situation like this you would definitely like to have multiple doses of intravenous vitamin c we've seen a stress and stress in before in the in the markers it has a viral suppressing and replicating effect and inflammatory response reduce frequency of inflammatory influenza like episodes severity and length of time in bed it is a very potent antioxidant definitely we would like to mention a little about vitamin d vitamin e which helps in increasing the t cell function it helps in increasing the b cell function and the natural killer neutral killer activity of the cells zinc is worth a mention discovered in 60 involved in intracellular signaling of innate and adaptive immune cells so without uh, vitamin z the activity of the immune cells will not be up to the mark the benefits of zinc supplementation for a malfunctioning immune system becomes clear step 4 is take your supplements when you talk about supplements there are a lot of uh, objections by a certain but uh, i'll come to that there is a disclaimer that i would like to mention here no nutritional supplement is fda approved for diagnosis treatment prevention and cure of any disease i know that everybody knows this they are appropriate only to support the structure and function of the human body there are a lot of mentions i would like to show you this in the academy of nutrition and dietetics vitamins minerals supplements do you need to take them was a question and then the answer was um, maybe or maybe not so there was not a definitive answer to the requirement of vitamins minerals and supplements another paper scientific amang what does it say most supplements do not prevent chronic diseases or deaths their use is not justified and should be avoided these are dietary supplements relating to dietary supplements we we'll move further john wayne once said life is harder uh, is hard already it is harder if you are stupid 2002 jama jama is a very well known uh, journal and there was a wonderful article by robert fisher and he said pending strong evidence 
from randomized trial, it appears prudent for all adults to take vitamin supplement. He said this way back in 2002, that all the adults do require to take vitamin supplementation. And this article is very well read and, and has been very well quoted. So he said only people like the major vitamin deficiencies like rickets and scurvy, etc. were not prevalent because the American diet did have a lot of uh, these vitamins. But micronutrients was lacking in the diet and which caused the system, the body system not to function properly. So he did advise that these micronutrients and vitamins uh, as supplementations are required for the body. George Soros, he said, once we realize that imperfect understanding is a human condition, there is no shame in being wrong, only in failing to correct your mistakes. So if you don't correct your mistakes, then you're a bigger fool. So what about uh, the recent uh, survey says, more physicians, nurses take supplements than they recommend. And it was seen that 24% of the physicians, 31% of the nurses do take supplements, but they do not recommend them supplementing. Is there something going on behind the scene? Let us see what is there. 64% of women physicians are on multivitamins. 51% of MDs, 59% of nurses use dietary supplements. 37% of cardiologists, 50% of orthopedics, and 59% of dermatologists are all on supplements. And the most interesting part, people who do not recommend diet uh, supplements, three out of four, 74% of all dietitians are regularly on nutrition supplements. This is a study. So what is the reality? 68% of Americans who have a very good diet are on supplements. 55% of people trust their physicians or doctors for what they recommend. Yet doctors do not talk about it because this is a rather unspoken. But now I talk about it. I do it to all my patients and I do recommend supplements to most of my patients. Another solid punch, vitamin D and probiotics. Recently has seemed to be on top and is very important in the present scenario. How does vitamin D help? So we get to this here. The recent discovery that vitamin D induces antimicrobial peptide gene expression. So vitamin D increases the peptide gene expression, which is antiviral. Biologically important for the response of innate immune system to wounds and infections. Evolutionary selection to place the cathelicidin gene under the control of vitamin D. So the cathelicidin gene is under the control of vitamin D and the expression of this gene helps to act against infections in wounds and infections. So vitamin D is, is in the body and it has to be activated either by sunlight or by taking and then it passes through the liver and the kidney and is activated to the active form called polycalciferol vitamin D3. It activates body's production of antimicrobial peptides. Of the peptides, there are 200 known peptides which will destroy cell walls of bacteria, fungi, viruses, including the influenza virus. Believe me, in some places, physicians prescribe high doses of vitamin D as an anti-inflammatory and antiviral. But I would like to go into this. So vitamin D is crucial in activating your immune defense system. Determination that vitamin D is crucial to activating your immune defenses. Without it, T cells will not be able to react or fight off serious infections. T cells must be first triggered into action and transformed from inactive cells into killer cells, which are primed to seek out and destroy all traces of foreign pathogens. T cells rely on vitamin D in order to activate. Yeah, probiotics. There is a study in, in children and it says that dietary probiotic supplementation for six months was safe, effective to reduce fever, rhinorrhea, cough incidences and duration. The antibiotic prescription incidence was reduced as well as number of missed school days attributed to the illness. So most of the illnesses are uh, associated with the upper respiratory tract and increasing your probiotic intake will help. Lactobacillus, 
not only improves your uh, immunology but also acts on your behavior cognitive and biochemical aberrations caused by chronic strain stress probiotics yield small but significant effect on depression and anxiety the emerging concept of gut microbiota as i mentioned earlier brain access suggests that modulation of the gut microbiota may provide a normal therapeutic target for the treatment or prevention of mood and anxiety disorders which indirectly again helps in increasing your immunity you require 5500 to 1000 international units per day of vitamin d 5000 to 5000 in adults but you take it with vitamin k so that you know it avoid hypercalcemia and deposition in, of calcium in your blood vessels the probiotic would be about 15 billion per day minimum you can take even more there are some more supplements lysine and plant based antivirals lysine decreases replication in feline herpes viruses suppresses clinical manifestation of herpes virus lysine prevents herpes simplex labialis so this is a patent and it says that the disclosure provides an oral antiviral supplementation composition so in this composition what do they have one is lysine an ascorbic compound vitamin c a flavonoid glycoside a threonine and a pyridoxine their antioxidants so an antiviral compound should have all of these what a plant based antivirals lemon balm is a phenolic compound this phenol neutralizes viruses on contact by attaching to them and thus preventing their union with cell receptors sage sage uh, is quite uh, uh, commonly available in most of the gardens and i think um, in telugu they say sage akulu i guess contains glycosides potent antioxidant mucosal health support the german commission e is like the fda in the us and which says that this sage is antibacterial fungistatic and virostatic looks something like this so very surprising that the, these leaves do have vitamin a vitamin c vitamin b complex a lot of minerals and essential oils the final step stage uh, which again has mushrooms berries and cbd uh, mushrooms uh, nanoderma lucidum as it is uh, one of the varieties called reishi and lingchi in quite uh, extensively used as a chinese herb medicine antiviral effect uh, antivirus it does have a lot of antiviral effect uh, polysaccharides and tryptophan are a major antiviral component of the nanoderma series mechanism is still not very well understood this is a uh, quite rampant uh, medical use now sambucus nigra it's called elderberry one of the most used medical plants worldwide okay and the fda has categorized it as generally recognized as safe so it is an otc product does have a lot of antiviral activity effectively treats upper respiratory symptoms stimulates your immune response and prevents viral infection it has worked on influenza a showed relatively strong defense against uh, syncytial viruses and uh, influenza viruses increase inflammatory cytokines as a function of stimulating the immune system so the initial inflammatory response is stimulated by elderberry uh cannabidiol is is now um, um, in lot of interest because of its association with anxiety and there are quite a few citations we have seen that it works on anxiety and does have a secondary effect on you know, the virus as well this concept recently caught up that um, you have seen a lot of people suggesting that you take to see you take ginger cumin coffee turmeric cloves cinnamon the reason was not yet understood so 
the reason here is the oxygen radical absorption capacity so the the, the more the oxygen radical absorption helps more saturation and also free radicals which are antibodies so not only that it helps uh, in increasing your saturation levels in the body but also as a boost your immunity so high orac values and nutrients such as iron vitamin zinc etc these are also high in the orac values boost your immunity so we review our talk again and, and what do we have what have we learned to get adequate sleep try to lower your stress eat a lot of fruits and vegetables take your supplementation don't worry about what people say vitamin d probiotics should be on the list vitamin c is important and eat a lot of vegetables and shrooms or mushrooms berries and up to you if you want to review cbd what is radical transparency transparency if i tell you something and if i don't do the same thing i am not radically transparent so what do i think take multivitamins vitamin d vitamin c elderberry preparations good probiotics and mushrooms okay. so if i take it and i benefit i will i will suggest the same to you so we coming to the end of our talk for me practice of medicine has opened the doors to the greatest adventure in life medicine is like a hallway which is lined with doors each door opening into a different room and each room opening into another hallway line with doors medicine is always wonderful and never will be finished thank you so uh, we are now in the hallway but luckily we have doors you can ex ex exit thank you very much dr nivedita can you come back Dr. Nivedita, are you on? Good morning, everyone. This is Rajendra, Secretary and Correspondent of the Alwar Group of Institutions. Well, uh, to give you a little gist about our institute, we have started this in the year 2006 with a great passion of developing. An excellent pharmacy college in this state of Andhra Pradesh. Our college is affiliated to Andhra University. We have excellent staff, faculty, and our principal instructor. Professor Strucker is a eminent person who has been in pharmacy for about 25 years now. And we are uh, one of those institutions who are recognized and uh, I mean, uh, accredited by NAC. We have conducted one week faculty and student development program by healthcare professionals on the 29th June to 4th of July in association with the Indian Pharmaceutical Association, APU State, International Association, Academic, for Software. IAAT. At least for this program, around 715 members have registered and around 450 have participated in the session every day. I sincerely thank all the eminent speakers for spending their precious time enlightening the faculty and the students with their knowledge. I thank personally Dr. K.V. Dalmo Sigaru, Principal, Andhra University College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University, Dr. K.P.R. Chaudhary Garu, former Principal, Andhra University College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University, Dr. T. 
రాజేశ్వరరావు గారు ప్రిన్సిపల్ మీడియా కాలేజ్ ఆఫ్ ఫార్మసీ డాక్టర్ జె విజయరత్న గారు రిటైర్డ్ ప్రొఫెసర్ ఆఫ్ ఏయూ కాలేజ్ ఆఫ్ ఫార్మసీ సైన్స్ సంగా యూనివర్సిటీ డాక్టర్ ఎన్ మురళీ కృష్ణ కుమార్ గారు అసిస్టెంట్ ప్రొఫెసర్ ఆంధ్ర యూనివర్సిటీ కాలేజ్ ఆఫ్ ఫార్మసీ సైన్స్ సంగా యూనివర్సిటీ అండ్ డాక్టర్ అస్లం ఆరఫ్ మేనేజింగ్ డైరెక్టర్ ఆఫ్ ఆర్ఎఫ్ నర్సింగ్ హోమ్ ఐ కంగ్రాట్యులేట్ ఆ ప్రిన్సిపల్ faculty and the supporting staff for conducting a webinar successfully and at time and also thank Mr. Kumar training and placement officer who technically supported for smooth running of the session. Finally, I thank all the participants for making this one-week program a grand success and all the best to the participants.